forgiven your sins. Just thank you. And if you're not born again, talk to us at the end of the service. <laughs> no, amen. You can be seated. Just be seated. It was so fun. We were worshiping. And the Lord was speaking to me while I was worshiping him. He really was. He was showing me just what I'm to do tonight and where I'm to go and what I'm to say. It was really fun. It's going to be a strong message. It's going to challenge the way we think we are. And pull us into who we've become. It's going to get our eyes off the fallen man and the fallen nature. Yeah, thank you. That's what I was looking for. I was, I had a good day of ministry. I had a 200 and some round mile round trip today ministry already today. I was up in Bloomsburg preaching the gospel, praying for the sick, just preaching the gospel. Just a few of us there, but it was good. Full gospel businessmen. Anybody hear that? Yeah, it was fun. A man brought a lady there for prayer and there was a bunch, bunch of fellas from, there was a handful of fellas from, uh, Full gospel businessmen. You know, it was funny when they called and asked me to do it. I thought of how far away it was and how long of a drive it was. And I had this service tonight. And I thought, Lord, that's a long trip for a, just a luncheon. And man, he's on me like when you think like that. <laughs> it was almost like, let me paraphrase. It was almost like, you better get you behind up there and preach the gospel. <laughs> Oops, I'm going. <laughs> You can, you can think this way and talk yourself out of God. You can get caught saying, well, you know, I'm just this way. Well, that's the way we are. I like to say it this way. No, that's the way we became if it's not edifying, if it's not life-giving. We weren't created that way. We became that way. And we so identify with the fallen nature that sometimes we're Christians, born again, spirit-filled, and still connect and identify with the fallen side of man. Okay? Isaiah 62 I want you to see this, and then it's going to be straight tonight, okay? Bang. You all right for that? You, all right? you ready? I'll keep smiling the whole way through. <laughs> Make sure you do. Every ten minutes, say, I love you, man. <laughs> keep me encouraged. Amen? I'm just excited because there wasn't many people there today, but the Lord said, what's the big deal driving that far to preach my word and show my word into somebody? While I was speaking, a man got healed while I was talking. His feet were numb and his legs were numb and he had degenerated nerves and he, he started to cry. And said, while you were, he came up and he wanted prayer to make sure it was totally resolved and, and, I gotta drink this. Forgive me. And, uh, he started to cry because I made this comment you hear me say a lot. I said, we don't go to church. We are the church. And he got convicted of religion. And he said his favorite comment is always telling people, I don't have religion, I have Jesus. But when I made that comment, he realized he's been stuck for years going to church. Forgetting he is the church. Watch this. We're waiting for God to move and we are the move of God. Come on. We are the move of God. We are the revival. <laughs> so get revived with me. Come on. <laughs> you see what? We are the move of God. It's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. The kingdom's in you. The kingdom reigns. Where you go, he is and he rules. Amen. Let me read this because I got to set this up. Verse 10, Isaiah 62 came in me while we were standing here and I got two other scriptures and the Lord just started to kind of open my heart to some stuff. Do you know sometimes natural knowledge can stumble you? Sometimes you can know too much about a situation. You can find out so much about what you're going through and so much about the sickness that's trying to get on you that it's more of a detriment than it is a help. You say, well, at least I know how to pray now. You already knew it wasn't God. You already knew how to pray. Now you just know that you've got to deal with a whole lot more fear and side thoughts because of all the complications involved with this thing. Because it seems naturally worse than it was before or something. Man, this thing's tougher than I thought. And then you're praying harder because you think because you're in faith, but it's because you're scared. I'm just being honest. You okay if I'm honest? You're going to have to be because I have a habit of being honest. <laughs> I'm called to tell the truth. Truth makes us free. I just know how we can do. We can get too much knowledge. We can go to pray for a sister and she tells us all her stuff. 
I'm not this sister because oh, this sister. And she can tell us all her stuff. And all of a sudden, we're challenged to pray. And we're praying because we're stretched. Yeah. Sometimes you don't need to know anything, but Jesus is Lord. I'm going to qualify this. I'm going to show you the word. I'm going to show you the word teaches that because we seem to need to know a lot of stuff. We ask a lot of questions. We need to figure things out. Know and well, what time and when and exactly when did this happen? Jesus is Lord and he's the revelation. Okay, I'm going to qualify it real good. But here's what I want to do tonight. I want to set a precedence with this scripture. Verse 10, go through, go through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up and build up the highway. Take out the stones. What stones cause? They block the way, you fall over. Years ago, a guy had a dream. He said, man, I had a dream about you. You were my dream. I'm going back 10 years. I said, really? I was in your dream? I said, man, I don't even have dreams. You're having dreams about me. I don't even get my own dreams. And he said, yeah, you were in my dream. I don't don't ever dream. That's all right. Old men dream dreams. So you, George, you probably get them all night long, baby. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> I said that for your whole row of friends. I got him, didn't I? <laughs> they liked it, George. Look, they're laughing. Listen, listen. He said, I had a dream. I said, what was the dream? He said, you were out in this big field. It was just this big dirt field and it was as far as you can see. And he said, as far as you could see, there were stones popping. Just here, 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 as far as, can you picture that? A dirt field with stones as far as you can see. He said, you were out in the middle of the field with a big wooden pole, sticking it in under and pushing. And I walked up to you and you were smiling. You were just smiling. And, and, and you said hi to me and I said, what are you doing? And you just smiled and said, moving stones. And he said, I woke up. But I understand that now ten years later. I do, I understand that dream. Because there's a lot of things. See, there's, there's ways that we think that stumble us. Your, your belief system is incredibly important. Your belief system, man, everything flows from your belief system. See, we are the church. I keep going back to this. We've been having some house gatherings and stuff, and now we moved them into other settings because we flat out outgrew the houses. And, and, and people say, well, maybe we ought to split them up and stuff. God's not saying that right now because in these house settings, there's like seven or six, seven congregations gathering together as well. And we're not trying to build a church. We're not trying to start a church. We are the church. Let's just get over that idea. Every time believers come together, we think, well, you're starting a church. We are the church. We're the church. He's building the church by pouring revelation into his people. And what's cool is God's not telling us to split it because what I'm finding is the people are hungry for the message that they're getting. So we're not supposed to split it because in the process of splitting, you could lose the message and the emphasis of why we're all together in the first place. And it could just turn into a, excuse me, a Bible study. I know a lot of you think what's wrong with that. <laughs> We've been having them for generations. They ain't changed a whole lot. We don't need more knowledge. We need the demonstration of the revelation of Jesus. We need to know who we are as the people of God. See, we don't have Bible study. We're, we're, what I'm finding is people come from six different backgrounds and they got six different belief systems. But yet we all serve the same Jesus and have the same Holy Spirit. It's true. And you're saying, well, what? what So what you're teaching is right and what they're teaching is right. No, we're looking at the Bible at the whole counsel of God and we're seeing what it says and acting on it and God's manifesting. That's pretty cool. People are getting touched and healed. And these people from other settings are enjoying it and hungry and they're gathering. There's a move of God going on. I, I, I don't know if you realize it, but God is moving. I mean, we were we had this little house church thing going Thursday. Just what you say, the revelation of Jesus. I didn't even know I was going here, but this will qualify in a minute what I'm really going to say. This fella, he gets the word of knowledge for a fella. He happens to be a pastor. We just prayed for his wife. He stands up and I said, sir, just come over. Let him pray for you. And there's other sick folk. We're going to pray for them. I didn't even realize what I said in the sense of 
as far as asking him what happened, but said, listen, God doesn't reveal what he's not going to heal. That thing's already gone. When I said that, do you remember me saying that? When he got over to Todd, he walked through. He said, man, it left while I was walking to you. <laughs> Come on, are you flowing with me? Wonder if I do believe that. These signs follow those that. Oh, man, I feel happy. <laughs> Listen, there's such a power available. You can get so convinced of the power of the name of Jesus that you realize God gave a word of knowledge. God exposed that. He's not a newspaper writer. He's not a gossip. He loves us. He's exposing a problem. Why? Because he wants to solve it. He already paid the price to. So I'm thinking that thing's finished. This thing don't have a chance. It was exposed by God, not him. It was called out by God. Might as well say bye-bye. You're done. When I proclaimed that, guess what happened to it? It left. I walk over to another fella. He was just prayed for. Had infection in his mouth. And I go around and make my rounds. And don't hear me wrong. I'm not trying to put emphasis on what I was doing and praying. There's a, there's a, there's a faith here. There's a revelation here that I want to impart. They prayed. They did right. He felt a little better. He was touched and glad he was prayed for. And he was in faith. I believe that. And the people that prayed were in faith. I walked over and I just said, so what's going on? Do you feel? He said, well, man, you know. It was just good being here, man. The word was clear. Yeah, they prayed for me. And I said, well, what's going on? Do you still feel it? Well, yeah. Li- yeah, a little bit. And then he stopped. And I looked. I said, well, do it again. That's what I said. We'll do it again. He went. <laughs> he said, now that quick, it just left. When you said do it again, it was just there. And you said do it again, and I did it again. Do you realize I didn't even pray? What am I believing when I say do it again? I'm believing it's so the will of God and the power is available and the Holy Ghost is here and he's on it. You know, you don't even have to pray a lot of times about things. You just believe. Remember Paul got bit by a poisonous snake? Who would agree that we tend to be reactionary because of natural knowledge? Okay? You, You follow me? So poisonous viper crawls in and bites my buddy Steve on the leg. We know it's a viper. We know it's one of the most poisonous families of snakes on the earth. We know that you turn blue and you're dead in moments. So we're all shouting, praying in tongues, scared half to death he's going to die. And we're calling on God to save him. Come on. We're already expecting trouble just because of the knowledge that that snake carries. And the knowledge of the covenant we're in doesn't supersede the knowledge of the problem. Are you, isn't my, am I going to... Is this clear? Because Paul never prayed. Because he's in covenant. I love that. That teaches me when I read that. I'm glad it happened. Way to go, snake. You try to mess up the people of God and you teach the people of God when they stand firm. Do you realize every time the devil touches you, he takes a risk, you'll come out of it with a greater revelation? Come on! Why don't we think that way? Why don't we think, oh, here we go again? Look, you keep touching me. Jesus is going to keep manifesting because I got my eyes on him. And he happens to be Lord. He's the firstborn among many. We're family. You're messing with family now. He died on the cross for me. He'll surely protect me. He died when I was guilty. Now that I'm right with God, how much more he'll save me through his life. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm telling you, just back off and don't even bother messing with me, right? That's how we need to start thinking. Instead, we go, oh, no. Oh, what? No. Oh, that's pray. I'm not being smart. We just do that. But we're praying for all the wrong reasons. We want to pray from the position of covenant. And that snake bites him. He, he didn't pray. I told, you, I told you all this testimony. Some of you are visiting and don't know. You know those little deer ticks, they carry Lyme disease. So I got one buried in my belly one morning, years, seven, eight years ago now. He's buried in, seven years ago, he's buried in my belly. It was sore and it was big red circle and big red dot. And since then, I learned that that's called the bullseye. 
See, I didn't know that then. I just, I just know Jesus. So I didn't have that natural knowledge to combat. You follow me? Because the natural knowledge in a good, good, God-fearing, spirit-filled Christian, good, God-fearing, spirit-filled Christian goes, Oh my God, that tick's infected. That means I'm infected. There's the bullseye. And then you feel different about it because of the knowledge you have about it. Now, I didn't have that knowledge. I just know they carry Lyme disease, and I know this didn't feel good. I mean, it hurt. I pulled it off on my back porch, and I looked, and I just laughed, and I thank God that I didn't have time for this. What I meant by that was, I've surrendered to you. I've submitted to you. You've got plans for me, and I'm in your will. I don't even have time for this. And I had the sense to not kill it. He said, what? Because if I'd have killed it, I'd have said it was a threat to me or somebody. Just go on your way. You're, you're touching the wrong world. You're in the wrong realm. Ding. You think that's arrogant and presumptuous. No, it isn't. That's Jesus. I didn't do that in faith. Thinking, oh my God, I hope I'm fine. Because that's what we think faith is. We think faith is taking a stand and not taking action. But we're not convinced that everything's fine. We, we think that's faith. Taking a stand... And not taking medical action and saying, okay, I'll just be okay. I'm just believing I'm okay. You're probably already in trouble. You probably ought to go get your help. <laughs> Is that making sense? Look, just go live your life if you're in faith. If that's real to you and that's a revelation, I'm not saying don't go get checked. Look, if you've got the red ring and the dot and you're one big concern, there's no condemnation. Go get yourself checked out. Get, this, get yourself the treatments and praise Jesus the whole way through. Okay, I'm being serious. But wonder if you believe you're in covenant and this thing absolutely has no place in you and you just fling it and you go live your life. Two years later, I found out that I appeared in my blood to have the treatment for that virus. And they were sure that I had to have that treatment because of the level of antibodies in me. And they said, you had to have the treatment. I said, I never had the treatment. You had to have Lyme disease and you had to have the treatment. You got the antibodies all through your blood. And I guess they give you a series of treatments. And, and then it hit me. That's a sign and wonder from God to me. He didn't need to do that. He didn't do that for the doctors. It actually confused them. He did that for me. I cried. They thought this guy is whacked. I'm sitting here crying because I got antibodies in my blood. And I just knew that God said, son, I got you covered. And I just, I love that. Now look, if I'm okay with that, I'm not being smart, okay? Backing way up. If I'm okay with that, leave me alone. Is that too harsh? Am I okay? I'm not out of bounds. Glory, am I out of bounds? Am I all right? Look. If I'm okay with that, leave me alone because from little up you're teaching me all these phenomenal Bible stories and miracles and trying to get me convinced and hooked and believe the power of God. When I'm old enough to believe it, you tell me to tone down and find balance. That's confusing. Look, if I want to believe God, I'm being serious. Leave me alone. If you're not going to edify my faith, just pray for me. But don't even talk to me. Don't project your fears and your wisdom. On me. Do you know how many moves of God were stopped by somebody walking up meaning well, saying, brother or sister, you really need to use some wisdom. (laughs) The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I reverence you over everything, Father, and I happen to believe I'm in an unbreakable, everlasting covenant of unquenchable love and fire from heaven. What do you say? We fulfill your will together. Wonder if I do believe greater sea that's in me than that tick that's in the world. <laughs> oh, I'm going now. No good for anybody. <laughs> do I have the right to believe that? Yes. Take out the stones. Lift up a banner for the peoples. Now, see, I'm talking like this, and I could sound like, boy, you're getting a little, you're popping off too much. You get here. You got to understand that there's testimony after testimony. I could stand here and tell you. About people being healed and restored by the power of the name of Jesus. It's hundreds. It really is. He was going through a little physical thing yesterday. And, 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 and he's been going through something in his life and just getting victory over it. But in spite of it and because of it, he just went to Walmart on purpose and prayed for 20 people. He was like, 
He ain't going to disqualify. He's got the right to touch the sick. He was going through his own physical issue and he said, I'm just going to go help others in their physical issue. You know what some logic says? Well, you know, I'm going through a struggle and now I've got to get right before I can pray. It doesn't say it. It just says go, preach and pray. So he went and prayed for about 20 people in Walmart. He said all kinds of things were happening. I know how we disqualify ourselves. Look, we're going to take out the stones and here's what we're going to do. We're going to lift up a banner. You know what that word It means a standard. We're going to lift up a standard for the... That's us. I don't know about you, but I hate living in fear. And I refuse to live in fear. And I'm going to cry because God, Jesus has delivered us from the bondage of fear. It says we don't ever have to return again to the bondage of fear, but His own Spirit is in us and we're heirs to God. And that Spirit in us cries out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. The fear of the bondage of death is destroyed forever. It's not even about life and death. Death is conquered. I'll live forever. You're looking at a guy that's never going to die. Oh, you'll have your day. You're misunderstanding. I'm never going to die. I'll transition. What do I fear? If I believe this gospel, fear is destroyed. If I love my own life and covet my own life and defend my own life, I'm a big target. Satan will mess with me. That's why Jesus said you got to deny yourself. He said, unless you love less all these things, you can't even be my disciple. You know why? Because the thing you don't love less is the target. Because that's what will steal your joy. When that thing you don't love less than God is attacked, that's when you're determined by it. But if you love everything less than you love God, he's your source. He's your motivation. He's your everything, even in the midst of trial. You'll see it with the right perspective. Does that make sense? But when your life's on the line and you're still holding on to it, it's a terrible thing because you're coming from a position of fear and desperation and defense. And he's a rock and strong tower in defense. He's the refuge in which I run. But if I lay down my life and I trust him with it, I've got nothing to hold on to. He, it's all in his hands. I honestly believe that's what it means, that that I can't be snatched from his hand. If I'm scripturally in Christ and in the Father through Christ, I'm in his hand. Let me just use the word hell without you. I'm not swearing. Hell can't touch me then. If I'm surrendered and submitted to the hand of God, I'd like to see you get me out of his hand. You get it? I bet that's what Paul believed when he got bit by the snake and didn't pray. Because you know we'd all been praying. Some of you that don't even believe in tongues would have been trying. Just because you didn't want him to die. Come on. <laughs> Does it make sense? Okay, here's what I want to say. I'll be quick with it. I'll do my best. Go to Hebrews 11. And then we're going to end up at Hebrews 2. Two scriptures. Who knows we tend to be reactionary? I'm just just be honest with me if you know what I mean. Okay? I don't want to be. I refuse to fear. I'm not saying that presumptuously and arrogantly. I, I don't even I don't I don't experience fear in my life. And I'm thankful for that. That's why I started to almost cry when I was talking about it earlier, because I can honestly tell you my heart's burning bright in faith for the Lord and, and trials and troubles and things that have come and tested my life and my family's life. It's never about fear. And I'm thankful for that. Fear is miserable. Fear is the opposite of our created value. Fear is the realm which hell functions by. The devil thrives on fear. It's like wounding an animal and there's a pack of wolves and now they got a scent trail. It's, 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 it's even different than just trailing the animal. You wound him. That's what fear is. It's a wound to your faith life and your heart and your perspective and your eye, your vision spiritually. And, and, and he's just on you like a pack of hounds to track you down. What Job feared the most came upon him. Nobody talks about that. Everybody talks about God giving permission to the devil and look what happened to Job. I don't hear anybody saying that what Job feared the most came upon him. He's a man under the law, under the law of sin and death. Satan actually had a God said, why are you asking me? He's already in your hands. Didn't he say that? He's already in your hands. Why? Because he's got this big door of fear open. And he's a target. See, we tend to be reactionary. We get our eyes and our intellect fixed on the problem. 
to the degree that the problem escalates and gets bigger and stronger. And then we turn and let that motivate us to turn and pray in the name of our God. And we're already. Yeah, we've lost major ground. I'm going to show you how scriptural this is. Did I say Hebrews 11? It's 12. At least we're close. This whole chapter 11 is patriarchs of faith. Isn't that cool? People that stood. I love reading those last few verses. I mean, you get yourself fired up when you start talking about subduing kingdoms, working righteousness, obtaining promises, stopping the mouth of lions, quenching the body. You start reading all through there. It's like, yay. And it says, since we've got this big cl- cl- cloud of witnesses surrounding us. In other words, we got these people as testimonies and examples. I've heard preachers say they're sitting up there in a circle cheering us on. I mean, you can interpret it that way. But we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. They have bore witness to laying down their life. The world wasn't even worthy of them. They, they ran the race. They're examples to us. We're to follow them. They bore witness. Of the life of faith in an Old Testament and Old Covenant. We've got a better covenant with better promises. And sometimes it's natural knowledge. We think it's so necessary. But I'll be honest, it just freaks us out, the natural knowledge. I hear people all the time. Well, yeah, but you know, that happened to her. And now because of that, then it's going to be like... And then two weeks later... And then we better pray. Whoa! Watch this. Let us lay aside every what? (laughs) Who's ever carried weight? I mean, come on. We got to lay it aside. Every weight. The sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance. Now watch this. If endurance wasn't necessary, it wouldn't be in there. Satan's going to try to wear you down and say, this is more about you than it is about God. And if I put you through enough hell, you'll surrender to it. And you'll pick yourself back up and lay down that cross. If enough affliction, and and if I just take enough jabs at you, and I just get enough things going on around you, you'll take it personal sooner or later, and you'll fail to endure. Hebrews 10 says that we have need of endurance, so that after the will of God is done, we can receive the reward. So that's what I meant earlier by every time the devil does that, he takes a risk that I'll come out of it with a greater revelation of God. So is it really a problem that I'm going through what I'm going through if I believe that we all know, we know God works all things together for the good? So what am I bummed out about if I believe that? I'm not being harsh. Is anybody hearing me harsh? Look, we got to raise the standard. And we can't get our eyes on the... Here's, here's what kicked this, these two verses off. I'm standing here and I remember this, this, this little precious black girl. She came to a service. And after I preached, she came up and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, I want this Jesus that you're talking about. And I just want more and more of him. And I'm thinking, yeah. You know, I'm used to us backing him in the corner. Come on, pray this prayer. <laughs> She'd come up and literally, what must I do to be saved? That's a switch. <laughs> they usually don't come running up like, we're usually like, you need to pray. Come on now. And people will pray. What about them crying out for God? What about them so convicted by his presence and the power of his word and the demonstration that they say, I need this Jesus. Well, that's what she said. And I was excited because I thought, you know, that's an easy target to pray for right there. All I said was, come on, Jesus, reveal yourself to her, touch her Holy Ghost. And I prayed. The presence of God came on this young girl. And next thing you know, she just gets whacked. She just falls on the floor. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking she's slain in the spirit, that term we use. I don't know. I'm not, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't praying for that. I just wanted her prayer answered. And I thought, ask and it shall be given. I'm just kind of in the middle here. I don't have to do much. I just want Jesus. Who knows he's already on the way? (laughs) I just said, come. She's laying on the floor. She goes into this trance. Some of you have heard this testimony. It's phenomenal. I cried for three days. 
after this happened. Three days, I couldn't even talk about it without bawling. I just cried and cried and cried. So phenomenal. She's in a trance and she's staring straight up. And she's got the most awful look of trauma I've ever seen on a human being's face in my life. I can't even describe it. Her face was so full of fear and trauma. And she was like paralyzed in that position with her eyes canatonic, straight just staring. I couldn't even possibly make the face she was making. Terrified look. And I didn't know what was going on, but I thought in my mind, hmm, this is a demonic spirit. That's what I thought. So I was standing there kind of like just weighing the situation and had my heart open to God. You know what the Holy Ghost said to me? He didn't even tell me what the spirit was. I was so thankful. You know why I was thankful? Because if he'd have told me what kind of spirit was, I'd have got involved. I'd have started praying certain ways. Saying certain things. Doing certain things. And guess what he was trying to teach me? That's why I cried for three days. He was trying to teach me all I need to know is he is Lord. He is Lord. Make a long story short, this lady was a Muslim her whole life. And her whole family was Muslim. She came to that service and came and wanted Jesus. Who knows there's a twisted spirit that blinds people on those kind of belief systems. Enough to make them think they're doing God a favor and the earth a favor when they crash towers. And You say, well, that's only certain Muslims. Look, it's just a twisted spirit. It's just, <laughs> we don't need to go there. Listen. She's laying there and the Holy Ghost said, Dan, what's happening is that she asked for Jesus. The spirit that has bound her her whole life. Watch what he said. Is beholding the face of the Son of God. No wonder it was terrified. It did me a whole lot of good to see that expression because I know what the devils think of Jesus. Oh, it tore me up, Brenda. I got so cocky. <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, oh, now you see. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hear me wrong. I wasn't in the wrong way. I know we're called to defeat them things. And I just saw that that thing was scared to death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost said the spirit that is bound in her whole life, I still didn't know she was a Muslim, said it's beholding the face of the Son of God. And I got this picture. Now picture this girl laying here. I picture Jesus like this. Standing over her. Looking down at her. And the spirit in her was freaked out. I'm telling you, you've never seen a human being look like she looked. Because it was the spirit. Are you here to torment me before my time? I just got real. I know that word cocky didn't go over well with some of you, but I was having fun. Look, I got excited. Because I know this gospel's true. And I know he's Lord, but... Sometimes you think you know, but you really don't know until you have experiences like that. See, some of these experiences will make you act like I act. Some of you think, how can he act like I act? <laughs> some of these experiences. <laughs> I watched the lady go. And Jesus, like this. You know what that gave me a revelation of? He rules in the realm of the Spirit. <sighs> the devils. See, they're used to conniving us. And getting us to believe our own fears and, and doubt our own doubts and, or believe our own doubts and all this stuff. They're used to messing with us. But when Jesus comes, when the truth walks in and goes like this. Because, you know, it was between her and Jesus and this devil. But it really had nothing to do with me because she said, I want Jesus and more of him. Who knows the fact that she was bound by that spirit has nothing to do. With her request and her ability to be set free. Because now she's calling on the king. And the king says, well, it's up to me now. I'll be there in a moment. As soon as she fell on the floor, she goes. So he was there right now. This really happened. <laughs> I'm walking around. I got real excited and confident. I felt. I felt good. I said, now you see, you spirit that has bound her her whole life, because the Holy Spirit told me that. I said that. 
I said, now you see why you have to go. Because he is Lord. I'm out of her. She went, way louder than that. And the Lord said, stand her up and tell her I love her. We got her up. She's like, praise is on her lips. Jesus. Prayed for her. She received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues. Filled her Holy Ghost. Now she's back down again. (laughs) The first time she fell because of the conflict, that spirit, I think he just knocked her down and just tried to play possum. Because some of us Christians think every time somebody falls on the floor, God's moving. I've been, in, I've been in prayer lines. You're praying and somebody way over there falls. And the Holy Ghost says, that's the devil playing possum, hoping you walk by thinking God's already moving. Touch him and pray in Jesus' name. And it, gotcha. All things are exposed in the light. I've seen it a whole lot. you got to be discerning. She falls out again. The guy that brought her comes running to me. I'm so glad you got to pray for her. He said, did God tell you she was a Muslim or did she? And I said, what? I had no idea. If I'd have known, I'd have messed it all up. I'd have been praying against some Muslim spirit, blinding spirit. I'd have been getting into all kinds of stuff. I'd been pulling out my little manuals. Come on, I'm being serious. What does she need to do to be free? All that call on the name of the Lord. What do I need to do to be in the position for her to be free? Just know that he's Lord. And if he tells me anything different or gives me instructions, fine. But that's where I'm at. I'm so glad he didn't tell me she was a Muslim. I'd have messed it all up. We'd still be there praying. I'm telling you. Am I doing all right? Okay. That experience impressed me in two ways. I need to know that he is Lord. And that's what I need to know. And it was just real healthy to see the reaction of these spirits that we sometimes get afraid of. It was real healthy for me to see the spirit's reaction in the presence of the king. So wonder if I draw close to him and stay filled with his presence. Wonder if he just keeps growing in me. Wonder if we believe greater is he that's in me than he that's in order. That doesn't give you a reason to walk arrogant, but to walk free. Let's lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us. Come on, this is good advice. I mean, what's it what's it worth? Come on. Sin. What a bummer. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now look. Looking to who? You see it in the word? Looking to who? What are you called to do? Look to Jesus. This is going to be a clincher. This is a good scripture. Go to Hebrews 2 and I'm done. And because of this scripture, we'll have the grace and and the doorway to just pray for the sick. You'll have enough... uh, Stirring in your heart to pray for the sick. Amen. So good. You know, righteousness is a big deal. Do you know that righteousness from God means that I've made you right, period. The righteous judgment of God tells me that apart from anything I could do or have done, he's made me right. The righteousness of God through Jesus says you're right with me. Stand before me and be right. And we're, we're so busy sometimes with weakness and yeah, but yesterday and yeah, but why don't we just receive right standing with God and know that we can't earn it. We can't increase it. We can just say yes. God, you love me so much. We, it should just be a wipeout for us. You love me so much that I know who I am. Seems like as much as you probably know. But I know who I am. And you came. And made me right through your son. And you're telling me that I'm right if I just believe. Changes everything. Righteousness. The gospels. The power of God unto. That's the same equivalent word to sozo. Study it out. You'll find out I'm telling the truth. 
Sozo is healed, delivered, protected, preserved. That word salvation is the same all-inclusive word. They're like cousins. They're like married. Man, they're the same. The gospel is the power of God under salvation for them that they're fully convinced that he loved me and Jesus' blood is enough and he paid the price. And even though I live like a jerk and a loser and selfish, he saved me and set me free and told me to stand before him and be right. It's the power of God unto salvation for them that believe, for in it righteousness is revealed, and the just as it is written shall live by faith, right? As it is written, the just shall live by faith, and, or from faith to faith. You get it? So I'm growing in that place of righteousness continually. I, actually, Romans 6, you go into Romans 6, it tells me that I'm a slave to righteousness, that I serve it and obey it. Man. Okay. Verse 6, it's testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you're mindful of him? God, what is man? Who is man that you even think about him? Come on. See, some of you get to see sometimes and think God ain't thinking about you. But his thoughts are more than can be counted. Or the son of man that you would what? Take care of him. Well, we can answer that question because we have the Bible now. He made us in his image. For his glory. And what is man that he is mindful? Created value. God doesn't change. We change, but he doesn't change. Now watch. You have made him a little lower than the angels. The original Old Testament says Elohim himself, God himself. He made him a little lower than Elohim or God himself. You have crowned him. He's he's not talking about Jesus right now. And he's not talking about God. He's talking about man. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Now look. And you set him, who? Man over the works of, capital Y, your hands. You've set man over the works of your hands. Do you know we're always waiting for the move of God? And God's waiting for us to move in him. We're waiting for God to come and he's waiting for us to extend our hands in faith and pray and believe and be confident and sure that he is Lord and loves and heals and delivers and saves and We're waiting on God to do something, and He did. He sent His Son, He put Him on the cross, He put Him in the tomb, and raised Him from the dead. And He's saying, now you go in my name. What Psalms, what is it, 115? The heavens of the Lord's and the earth He did give to the children of men. So He set man over the works of His hands. You have put all things in subjection under His feet. Now watch. For in that he put all in subjection under him, look, he left nothing that is not put under man. Now watch. But, you know, when I'm ministering to somebody, I get that but word. I'm like, but nothing. (laughs) But is not a good word. You know, that's like a, yeah, but. What do you mean, yeah, but I just gave you the word of God. Yeah, but that's not how I feel. No, it doesn't matter how you feel. You know, I'm not, I'm not mad at anybody. What I'm saying is, when you hear the word but, it's not usually a good word. So look, but now, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. Did you ever get frustrated by a situation that you couldn't see victory over? Did you ever pray and pray and pray and not see a mountain move? Yeah. And it starts getting on you and, it's, and you start... And you, you know that all things are in subjection under your feet, but yet you're not seeing it. And the tendency is to create more theory, go looking in closets. The tendency is to make the issue even bigger and add to the mountain. You know, I've been praying for this mountain for four months and it just ain't moving. This is a whopper, boy. This is a tough bugger. That's how we talk. I'm just be Look, we're raising the standard. Come on. Boy, I'll tell you, I bumped into some mean mountains, but this baby got teeth, you know. And you were bearing the scars, right? No. Look. But now we don't yet see all things put under him. So what do we do? Exploit that? Talk about that? Increase that? No. Here's a second but. See, God gave us a but, and it bothers you when you read it, but he answers with a but. But.
But now we don't see all things in subjection under him. But we see Jesus. Oh, man. Do you hear what he's saying? Let me just, let me talk plain English to you. He's saying, you better keep your eyes on Jesus. You get your eyes off the problem, stop talking it, get it out of your mouth, get it out of your heart, get it out of your head, and you get your eyes on Jesus. Because all things are given to you and put in subjection under you, and even though you're not seeing it in subjection, look at Jesus. Just see Jesus. He's the revelation. We don't need more revelation. We're we're seeking for more revelation all the time. I hear people praying for it. He's the revelation. I don't need the revelation that she's a Muslim. I just need to know whatever she got, whatever it is, she has to be free and he's coming because he's Lord. Now get her, Jesus. I like that. I remember, I see Rick sitting here. I met Rick at a church. I hope you don't mind me saying this. But I remember praying for him and the Holy Ghost got on you. He hit you. And he smacked you. He said, he smacked me. I got excited. And when the Holy Ghost hit him, I said, get him, Jesus. Get him. Get him. That's not, you know, maybe you don't even remember that. But I said, get him. Get him. That was my prayer. I said, Father, right now. And the Holy Ghost went. And he went. And I said, get him. Get him. And he just sat down in the pew. I said, yeah, get him. This went. Didn't need his history. Didn't need to. Get him, Jesus. Here he sits tonight. Growing in the Lord. You get it? I like it. Look, we don't see all things in subjection. But where are we supposed to look? Looking unto the author and finisher. It was a joy that was set before him, so he endured whatever he had to to get there. What do you say we follow him? But we see Jesus Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And he's talking about him being our high priest all through these chapters. That came in my spirit tonight. Listen, we tend to be very reactionary people. We tend to pray more because of the problems we're concerned about or see rising than the covenant we're in with him. The reason I'm standing and praying isn't because I feel so bad and I need to feel better. I'm not making that confession over me. Don't anybody blow the whistle. What I'm saying is I'm using an example, an analogy. Say somebody's really going through sickness. I'm not standing praying because I feel so bad and I need to feel better. I know I'm in a covenant that protects me. And in Jesus' name, I thank you, Father. It's been finished and I'm praying to you from the position of covenant. This thing has no power. I don't see what's not subjecting. I see Jesus. He just got to bow. Does that make sense? Because I know I watch people, not on purpose. I just it just unfolds. They start trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that. And I will bet you, if we just, if the eye is single, the whole body is flooded with light. Does it make sense what we're saying? I showed you two places where we're to look to Jesus and see Jesus in the midst of the trial. That's all we see, folks. See, I, I've been a Christian for 12 years in June. It'll be 12 years in June. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people pray for people and then they say, well, nothing happened. I guess maybe it's because and I wonder if why and maybe you ought to do this. And then. My Bible says, look to Jesus. If you don't see all things subjecting, i got one alternative. I'm not optional. I'm not multiple choice. I'm looking to Jesus. I like that, Dale. Romans 5, 3 and 4. Romans 5, 1 says that we have peace with God. We've been justified by faith and we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says we have access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. Verse 3 says not only that, but we rejoice in our tribulation. Because we know that our tribulation produces what? 
Patience, patience, character, character, hope. And hope doesn't fail because the love of God's in our heart by the Holy Ghost. Tribulation has nothing to do with sickness, for one thing. He's just talking about the sufferings for the gospel. He's talking about the pressures, demonic pressures, things that get in your face and challenge your faith. And sometimes it can be in the form of sickness. So Dale has a situation and, and all of a sudden... What, what maybe happens is the devil comes up and says, and he's preaching the gospel to somebody or you're preaching healing to somebody. And all of a sudden the devil says, oh, is that right? Or whatever. And a lot of times it's just flat out warfare. It's in your face confrontation stuff. Did I tell you about the testimony? I told you about the testimony when I preached in my home group. And that night my son woke up and couldn't even breathe. The very night. Why? Because he, he, he picked out my son because that should move you and react, cause you to react. He's going after things to make you react. So it says this. It says, see, Romans 5 is actually exciting to me. That's when I've preached out that so much. Watch what it says. We've been justified by faith and have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access now into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's like, yay, that's shouting stuff. But Paul doesn't skip a beat. He stays on the same note and says, not only that, guys. I mean, come on, Paul, get a grip. <laughs> but see, because I don't know a lot of people that glory in their tribulations. God, you're going to work this out for the good and glory of your name. I, I just thank you for the revelations that you're releasing of the living Christ through my life in this adversity. Because it's working together for the good. I'm not one bit moved. I'm in covenant. I've got promises that are yes and amen. This ain't even about me. It's about you and your name. And you'll defend it because you're the Lord Almighty God. You get it? You glory in your tribulation. Now, come on, be honest. If I were to get you to raise hands, when we enter into tribulation, we're on the prayer line and we're already crying before we dial the phone. I'm just being honest. We're raising the standard. I'm not being mean. It's because we love our lives too much. We're, 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 We're saying, save me, help me, deliver me. He already did that through Jesus. Now the devil's trying to come and steal the power of the gospel. And you have got to stand in covenant faith and covenant power. You have to come from the position of deliverance and redemption and healing. Is this making sense? We glory in our tribulation. Why? Because I can't lose. I can only come out of it with a greater revelation of the one that I say I believe in. Paul said, I know him in whom I've believed. Man, Peter said, where will we go, Master? Only you have the words of eternal life. Besides, we've come to know and believe. You're the Christ, Son of the... You hear? It escalated. Revelation. We've come to know. We've been tracking with you so long. We've been going through so much with you. You're so faithful. You're so steady. You never change. You're the Lord. That's what Peter was saying. 